Once again, I am so happy that you chose to join us. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again we come asking that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh as we study your word. Father, we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again we are on the harmony of the law and the gospel, which is our uh, the 12th article of faith. And our author writes, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good, and that it that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin to deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. And today we will pick up where we left off last week with verses 24 of the seventh chapter of Romans. And once again, uh, I'll be using the NIV unless otherwise stated. So Romans 7, 24 and 25. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind I'm a slave to the law, to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Wow. What a mighty God we serve. There is so much packed in those two verses. Uh, before we even began to unpack them, those two verses screams this is the harmony between the law and the gospel. If when you hear me read at the beginning of this lesson, like I just did, what the author writes, and you say to yourself, what is she talking about? Or you just nonchalantly listen as though it's just a bunch of gibberish, then I invite you to restart this lesson and listen again, in light of Romans, the seventh chapter, verses 24 and 25, Paul states the condition of every believer. He speaks of the tension that exists for every believer. No matter how long you've been on this journey, there's a song with uh, the lyrics. It, it says, I've been working for Jesus a long time. And I'm not tired yet. Right about now, I like to differ with that. I, I, I do get tired. Now, I know it sounds all spiritual and holy to say that I've been working for a long time and I ain't got tired yet. But the reality or my reality where I live is that I get tired. I wish I didn't have to deal with me. I get tired of wanting to do what is right and not doing it. I get tired of having a well thought out plan to do what is good. I, I mean, I might write it down and even break it down into steps and put bullet points on it to make it simple. And yet, I find that I am not able to follow through long enough for it to become a habit. I get tired of beating myself up on a regular basis uh, uh, about the same thing that I promised myself I would not do. <coughs> I get tired of not wanting to do a thing because it has proven to me over and over that it's just not going to end well. And yet I still do it. And then I lie 
to myself saying this time it's going to be different. Somebody coined the phrase that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Y'all, I get tired of being insane. Paul calls our condition wretched. Last time I gave the, the Greek meaning of wretched. I said that it's a person who is exhausted after battle. To me, for Paul to use the word wretched to describe our condition, is saying that we are in a constant battle. Note also that he speaks in the present tense when he says, I am, not past tense as in I was. He says, I am wretched, and, 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 which means that if it's in the present tense, I'm wretched every day. Every day I'm exhausted dealing with the battle within me. Trying to fix me is exhausting. And it's a losing battle. Can you imagine every day going out for battle to fight a losing war? Every day the results are the same. Zero for me and 100 for the enemy. That's exhausting. Picture the armies of Israel when the giant Goliath had them feeling defeated. In the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel, Goliath would taunt the army to send out just one man to fight him. And, 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 and whoever the loser, the loser uh, and his army would be the servants of the winner. The Bible says for 40 days, morning and evening, he would taunt them. And from King Saul to the least person in the army, they were shaking in their boots every single day. Can you imagine the exhaustion of facing a battle, knowing that you will not win, feeling defeated even before the battle begins, every day facing defeat? What could be more wretched than exerting all of your energy to conquer the inner man and yet come to the end of the day and he is still taunting you saying, is that all you got? Until you finally cry out for a deliverer. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Think about that. My physical body that I carry with me everywhere I go is a body of death. I don't care what I do to it. Eat healthy, exercise, meditate, go to the doctor, whatever. And, and, and I say that, and, and everybody, the people that know me, know that when you are talking about trying to maintain health, you are on my street. So, so do all you can to keep this body functioning, but know that it's still a body of death. It's dying and no amount of anything is going to prevent that. Remember 1 Corinthians that we read last week. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 56 says, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. My simple way of understanding that is to think in terms of a wasp and say it like this. The sting of a wasp is its venom and the power of the venom is the pain. In other words, if there was no venom, the wasp's sting would have no effect. And so it is with death. If it were not for sin, death would not have a bite. And if it were not for the law, sin would have no power. Paul tells us in the fifth chapter of Romans that even though folk were sinning before the law was given, 
God did not charge them with it until he gave them the law. Now, lest I go off on, on one of my scenic routes, that's all I'm going to say about that. So Paul asked the question, who shall deliver me from this body of death? The body is the headquarters of indwelling sin. And the members of the body are instruments of that indwelling sin. Sin, it, it, it stands to reason that if sin lives in my body and it uses all of me, it, it uses my hands, my feet, my eyes, my mouth, my thoughts, uh, it uses all of me to commit sin then it stands to reason that I can't go inside of me to be delivered from this body of death because it's sin's headquarters. So who will rescue me from this body of death? My deliverer must be an outside source. Nothing in me can deliver me. I come to the end of me. I, I, I cannot deliver me. I'm totally tapped out. Romans 7, 25 again says, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now right here is where Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount. He, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he's saying, blessed is the man who comes to the end of himself. Blessed is the man who arrives, who has arrived at spiritual bankruptcy. Why? Because it is only here, at this point, at, at, at the empty, at the bankruptcy, where God's help is given. Romans 7, 25 again says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus is the who that delivers me from this body of death. It's as though Paul has carried us through the whole of chapter seven to bring us to the shout. He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he ends with an exclamation mark. We learned in school that when an exclamation mark is at the end of a sentence, that means read it with excitement. Read it with a shout. Rejoice in the fact that God, through his son, Jesus Christ, has already done it. He's already delivered me. Our response to the feeling of wretchedness and discouragement and failure to which the law has brought us because of sin that is dwelling in us, our response is to remind ourselves immediately of the fact, the facts that are true of Jesus Christ. Paul burst forth with, with praise to God. There is deliverance from sin. The deliverance comes through the great deliverer, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is the deliverer from sin. He alone can deliver me from this body of death. He alone can deliver me from sin. It is Christ Jesus that the, it is in Christ Jesus that the harmony of the law and the gospel come together perfectly. And it is right here where we must end this lesson. Until next time, be blessed and come back and join us again. Bye-bye.